Really, really excited, uh, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And obviously, thank you so much, Rakesh, for, for being here and presenting. Everyone, if you're not familiar with Rakesh, he's a senior architect at uh, the Netherlands-based bank, ABN AMRO. And we're going to be talking about kind of uh, their journey with decentralized data and what they've kind of moved forward because they were moving forward before data mesh was even a concept around decentralized data. So they have a lot, lot of knowledge to share <laughs> about this. Um, and so I, I would like, I'm going to, I think we're going to save the questions for the end in general. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rakesh so he can kind of uh, walk you through what he's learned around the platform and the architecture and, and all of that. So Rakesh, if you, uh, you have the floor. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Scott, for having me and giving me this opportunity actually to share the knowledge uh, with this community and uh, especially what we're doing at Avi Ramro. Uh, yeah. So, good evening, everyone, uh, and good morning for people who joined from uh, North America and good afternoon for people who joined for uh, South America. Uh, Today, we are going to uh, discuss briefly about uh, AV Nembro data platform uh, architecture and also uh, a brief uh, flavor of data mesh and how we are applying those principles. Uh, before, uh, before I go to the next, uh, uh, start the topic, uh, a brief introduction about me. Uh, I'm practicing actually working for AV Nembro Bank and uh, I work as a uh, domain architect. Uh, outside what you can call it, the solution architect, uh, mostly work on the platform. I'm working for four and a half years with Avina Group Bank, and uh, before that, also have a lot of experience in data management. Uh, at Avina Group Bank, we are busy with uh, building cloud native solutions, and as an architect, I believe uh, good things always take time, and you should always uh, do things first time right. Okay, um, so topic for today, uh, we're going to cover an overview of AV number of data platform, how it would look like, and a brief journey about it. And uh, also would like to remind you uh, some core principle of data mesh. And uh, finally, we will look at, at AV number, how we apply those core principles. Our AV number is really a data mesh architecture, or it's a flavor of it, and what does it mean, and how we are evolving uh, to that direction. Uh, before uh, going to AV Nambro architecture, uh, let's look at uh, uh, some introduction about AV Nambro Bank. Uh, AV Nambro is one of uh, uh, leading bank in the land, actually. Uh, most of the people in Europe uh, know, uh, for people on US and South America. Uh, a brief introduction. So our strategy is, uh, and our purpose is banking for better generation to come. And in order to, uh, we make our life for our customer uh, very easy. Uh, uh, we have a three strategic pillar actually. So customer experience, uh, which is most for our uh, customer. This is, uh, we, we put a lot of emphasis on this uh, principle actually. We have a sustainability in our uh, core values. Uh, we do everything uh, which is sustainable, whether it's uh, uh, offering a product to a consumer or doing something for climate. and. Uh, the last one is a future proof bank. We always think ahead and see what is uh, coming up and how to adopt ourselves. Actually. And uh, IT helps a lot uh, to achieve these three uh, uh, pillars, actually. Uh, if you want to know more about every number of bank, you can go to this uh, URL. Uh, you can read about every number of bank purpose and status. Okay, uh, like I explained, uh, future proof bank uh, we want to be. Uh, we are actually, and every future proof bank needs a uh, future proof data platform. And uh, uh, our data platform uh, uh, is basically uh, consists of three components, uh, which is very general. So you have a data provider. So we have a data provider and So one is a data provider, which is uh, a sources sending data, uh, which, is, which is normal. And then uh, you, you want to share those data with the data consumer, basically applications. But before sharing, uh, you have to do a certain things. And first, 
first thing you has you need to ensure that what data you want to share which is basically called data sets so you want to define and make a glossary of all the it and and a consumer want to consume the data that they, they would like to know what they want to consume actually and this and before uh, a provider can share the data and consumer can consume the data there has to be a proper agreement between those so a data sharing agreement so at least provider from provider point of view i should know how many consumers are using my data and each consumer for what purpose and to facilitate this process we have something called data marketplace actually where a provider can publish the data consumer can search the data and then they can request for data sharing if it's a group that free to go and once that part is done which is whole about the catalogue and governance then the, then the our data platform come in the picture which is have the capability which enable a provider to share data with the consumer and this platform for us for data delivery is called digital integration and access layer and this is uh, we call it a dial in soft actually uh, and this this layer is uh, uh, is important for us because this is a backbone of our whole data distribution strategy uh, we look into uh, this uh, platform how it has evolved over the period of time uh, like uh, so any data platform evolution so if you look at uh, from 20 years back everything is start with data warehousing so people our organization has moved from a data warehousing from there uh, towards say uh concept of big data comes in 2010 and then from there uh, the concept of uh, four years back uh, comes a lake actually data lake and we have been no exception to it actually so we also have adopted certain strategy over a period of time we also started with the mindset of uh, data warehousing initially uh, where the application used to basically publish the data by etl into a data ingestion layer and then from there we just learn to send data to a different data mart and data mart uh, a different bi to link or continuing application used to connect to data mart to give a value to a certain business line actually uh, this 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 model in general had a problem what the problem of problem of governance so people you don't know who is you using your data for what purpose there was no data proper data sharing agreement there was no proper data data about data and there was another thing this this whole technology was based on on prem on prem vms and uh, tooling actually so there was also a problem of scalability so what we did was uh, we also started uh, with the market we looked we looked towards a uh, uh, big data technology qs pack where we say okay we have a providing applications uh, which send data to a, a big storage area based on big data uh, hadoop and then those data will be uh, sent to a sourcing zone and then uh, from there data will be moved to a consuming zone and a consumer can take the data basically and this will be a governed process so it means who is sending data will be registering the data sets who is consuming data also we, and whole lineage across the data platform will be captured and this we started our journey for integration access layer which was based on on prem technology and hadoop actually uh, but pretty soon we realized that on prem is uh, a good way to start to get into governance but we also have to make more scalable solutions more self service and we have to provide our uh, provider and consumer with uh, a lot of other other uh, features as well then we started uh, towards a cloud move and our cloud move was more about uh, cloud native solutions it's global it's based on the microsoft uh, uh, azure platform at least not only in fact uh, here if you look at you know data platform this this is simplified version of our uh, uh, cloud native and scalable solution uh, high level architecture I have removed other part of uh, metadata related and other aspect uh, just just focusing more on the data platform uh, here if you look at the, we have a three layer so we have a governance layer we have a metadata layer and we have a data layer i think all three layers are 
are very much important if you want to have a good and uh, successful data platform. First, governance layer where a data provider and data owners basically uh, make a request to onboard their data, and we have something called sourcing applications where we show we, we register the data sets or all metadata related to the data. And then uh, once governance is defined, uh, uh, metadata is registered, uh, data sources can basically send their data in different mechanism, whether it can be a file system, API or streaming to our data store actually. And there we also do some validation whether what was committed from a data owner perspective, the data is in line with the expectations. And then once data is available, it's, you can always look into a data marketplace and search it. If, it's, if you find that data is valuable for you, you look at and then you, you request a data uh, sharing agreement actually. So uh, you say, okay, I want to consume this data. Okay, fine. Then you, you request for a data sharing and then data sharing applications basically facilitate to provide that data owner to make yes or no, if you're allowed to uh, allow to use the data for some purpose. And then once done, done, then when you, in a consuming application, you register your metadata related to your application, and then you get data in a different format. So you can have, we also have a polyglot where data is available in a different consumption pattern. So whether it's API, or it's you want to have in a synapse, uh, or Twitter file, or many more. So this is a very basic version, but we provide a lot of flexibility to our consumer, the way how we want to consume the data. It's really also depend on the nature of the consumer, whether it's a, a machine learning type of consumer model, even or it's a really domain-based uh, consumer, or it's just a normal application. Okay, so uh, you must be wondering, okay, uh, uh, we have such a uh, good data platform and we, we are very cloud native and what changed for us and what we're looking towards, where we're going actually. Uh, actually, we as a given every number bank also, we look always look for improvement and see what we can benefit from the new trends, new technologies, and always have been with the market. And we also look at our internal uh, internal uh, needs as well. So uh, it's a big bank. We always have uh, uh, our business is also growing. So high demand of data provider and consumer. So there has been always high demand. And in order to uh, basically have a uh, more scalable uh, data platform, we also are looking for to looking to improve our data platform uh, to to always improve the new principle. We also want to enable our data provider and consumers with the new capabilities uh, where uh, it's most in the nature of self-service where they can do self-service and should be able to publish the data sets or consume it. So those are some reasons which uh, basically also uh, uh, forced us to think how we are doing a data platform or data management, how should we uh, match up with the industry and shall we adopt certain standard which is in the market. Okay, um, before uh, going to data mesh principle, uh, before going to uh, explain you how we apply certain data mesh principle, a brief uh, uh, preview of uh, what is data mesh. So data mesh is a collection of actually a good software practices where uh, you have a domain driven, uh, driven design, product thinking and platform thinking. These, these are the not uh, a new term. This has been in the industry for long uh, in a different context being used. For example, domain driven design or platform thinking, we have been doing uh, from, from beginning before the data mesh board was introduced. But good to know that what we are doing is already aligned with what others are also trying to do actually. Uh, if you look at uh, data mesh core principles, so this is a picture I got I just uh, got it from Samad Dejani. I think you all must have read the uh, book actually. It's a very nice book. Give you an insight about uh, data mesh and how can you apply certain principle. It talk about a domain driven ownership where uh, you, it's, it's actually try to uh, reduce the isolations where each domain is responsible for their own data. 
it's it's talk about uh, data as a product where uh, don't treat data as a byproduct of ETL process, but it's more about adding more uh, information to your data. So for example, uh, what uh, domain this data belong to, what, how secure this data is, who can use this data, for what purpose this can be used, what recipe it has, so all those information. So you treat data as a product, not only the byproduct of certain ETL process. It's talk about a self-service data platform actually, where uh, uh, you, you basically enable provider and consumer with some infrastructure capability uh, so they can basically do, uh, they can uh, source their data, consume data. You don't want to be a, a bottleneck uh, middleman team. So it's, it's more about doing everything self-service. And the last one was about federated computational governance where you don't want to be in a situation where you always a uh, top-down governance where everything what your top uh, manager says that that is the governance process. No, you provide a capability, a tooling, and where each one uh, uh, into the bottom line is responsible for a certain uh, governance decision, and that should be an automated way. Actually, these are the uh, principles. Okay, uh, in, the, in terms of uh, governance, actually, so I will look at how we do a governance at Avina Global Bank. Uh, in Avina Global Bank, uh, 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 we do a governance using a uh, data marketplace, and I will, I will show you how we do it. So you have a providing application, we call it, uh, where you have the data, and you have a consuming application, where data need to be consumed, actually and they want to exchange the data. There are some roles defined uh, for this data. So for instance, uh, a owner, uh, application owner, uh, who manages uh, the providing application is called application owner. The person who manages consuming application also called application owner of consuming application. And then you have a couple of more roles. So, the person who authors the data within the system is called data creator. And the person who is responsible, accountable for a data set, who can verify a certain accuracy about the data is called data owner, who has basically a say on the data sets. And the person who is uh, basically also want to use the data is actually called data user. And and then you have a data consumer who looking into the system actually. Uh, okay, so before, uh, uh, so there are two layer I explained uh, in the previous architecture. So this is uh, more about the coordination. So where a data uh, owner, data, uh, uh, data creator and data consumer. So if data consumer want to consume the data, go to the previous and then they make the request. Okay, I want to use this data. A data owner basically give yes or no about they can use it or not. If they say at a higher level, okay, they're allowed to use the data, then application owner and uh, application owner of sourcing, application can do exchange some information. And this is whole process is governed by uh, marketplace because data marketplace actually. Uh, and once that is done, then uh, our DAL platform, which I explained to you uh, in the previous slide, can enable a uh, provider to send data to consumer actually. So this is more about a governance. And I think it's also important before you want to make your architecture more distributed, you also want to know how you are in a control of certain activities, especially data governance. Otherwise you can have uh, 50 department within your uh, 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 within your organizations, and you can sometimes lose the control of governance. Okay, um, data as a product thinking. Uh, this is something uh, uh, we we have been doing in, in some somewhat extent, not very extensively, but uh, also uh, we are evolving this uh, uh, day by day actually applying an principle. So we have, for example, a data platform, we, we send data, uh, sources send data to a data platform and consumer basically take data 
from the data platform. Uh, in order to do that, we have something called sourcing guidelines. What you do is, as a part of sourcing guidelines, if you have a resource or provider, you are, it's not like you can source any data uh, without much information. So your data has to be, uh, you have to describe your data. So you can say, okay, who is the owner of the data? Uh, who, what is the business metadata? In which context this data is useful? What is the data quality of the certain data? What is the security? So for example, this data is really sensitive or it's just general, anyone can use it. And also some recipe. So for example, if you have two data sets, you can also say, this A, data set A and data set B can be combined on this key. So for any consumer, data consumer, if you want to consume both, then they already know what data set means. Similarly, uh, on the consuming side, we have something called consuming guidelines. So if a data consumer wants to consume the data, they really have to make a uh, agreement with the data provider that they want to use the data and also they also need to specify use case so for what purpose they want to use it. It's for finance reason, for report, uh, reporting reason, for regulatory reason. So at least you know this data sets been used for this purpose. And they can also sometimes say, okay, this is a threshold for my data quality and I want to use the data. Uh, I can use the data uh, uh, only if it meets certain uh, threshold. Another principle of data is a domain-driven design, actually. Uh, what it is, uh, it's, a, it's more about a domain taking more responsibility for the right uses of data. And this is also uh, one of the principles which we have been doing for quite a two, three years now. We have at the consuming side, we have something called a domain data store, actually. What we do there is, uh, it is this domain, this domain based, uh, domain based uh, consumption pattern. So where we basically take the data related to a certain domain and, and integrate this data set to meet a certain business demand. And this are, uh, these are really actually, it really help you to how fast you can consume the data. Actually. So, a domain A, for example, uh, say, okay, I need these three data from provider A, two data from two data set from provider B, six data set from provider C, and all together they'll go to domain data store one. B have some, other, so have, two has some other requirement, three has some other requirement. So all the domain uh, based uh, integrations and, and uh, data value creations we do in particular domain. Okay, uh, another principle what we do actually, we, we, we have been focusing a lot on the self-service categories actually about our uh, data platform. But we started not as a self-service initially because it's kind of uh, uh, started with centralized with Hadoop and then we went to cloud native and once you're in the cloud native, it also offer you some capabilities actually uh, uh, and also opportunity to make a self-service. And how we, do, how we do that actually? So we have an organization basis, we have a central infrastructure provision team for public cloud, which is for all the teams in the bank. And, and on top of that, we have a couple of data teams. Actually. So one data team uh, focus on making a self-service capabilities infrastructure that can be used by a data platform uh, and provider to source the data in the first page. So uh, the example of capability can be a, a good uh, ingestion pipeline for batch or APIs or streaming where they can just call an API to source the data or send uh, their data sets onto a certain, uh, certain endpoints. So it's really make them faster to uh, source the data. On the consuming side, uh, it's more about a domain driven design like I explained. So with another team on one data platform team, what they do, they do they, they create a blueprint actually. But in the consuming, there is a lot of similarity between different domain, how the data platform look like. 
we're using a blueprint, they develop their integrations in the domain. And that really speed up their uh, consumption and also it, it, it helps banks a lot to bring a business to, uh, to bring a business value out of data. Okay, so uh, and this has what what I said so far. We have been already doing, but we also looking towards more about future. How and how should we proceed, and how can we adopt more and more good principle of uh, data mesh? Actually, and not only data mesh, but all others. How others are doing. So we also try to learn from across the industry and try to improve our architecture. We are also looking more about the distributed architecture and more federated way. Uh, you saw on the consuming side, we already have a lot of federations, but on the provider side also, uh, we want to do a lot of uh, decentralizations where we want to bring, uh, we want to make a self-service capabilities and enable all the provider to use those self-service capability or consumer to source and exchange the data while keeping data governance and metadata in check. So at least we have oversight who is using what for what purpose. That's, and so in, in principle, we want to bring provider and consumer more closer uh, than ever actually. So that is also a principle of uh, data mesh as well. We are continuously looking towards a circular approach. Okay, that has been, uh, uh, that has been about uh, how we are applying some data mesh principle into a number of architecture. I uh, have some summary, which is some takeaway you can see. So what you have seen, no architecture is right or wrong, actually. So it really depends on organization, what is the need of organizations. If organization is very small, then distributed architecture may not make sense sometimes. If it's big enough and you have a scalable demand kind of uh, dem uh, requirement, then it can make more sense. Also data message organizational change. It's not about only technology because people have to take, uh, have to, they can give more responsibilities towards consumers and data provider, data consumers. If a certain domain is not ready to take certain responsibilities, then I think uh, pushing the responsibility can worsen the situations than improving it. Uh, yeah. And decentralization of infrastructure and data platform can scale up and meet your demand, uh, but only it will work if uh, organization is mature enough and also fully committed to tell your responsibility. So data mesh is a good concept. Uh, it's required both organizational and technical change. It's not only about technology. Uh, I refer a few of the, uh, uh, the blocks. I always read. This is one of the blocks from uh, Pete Hine, actually. Uh, he's, he's working with Microsoft now. He used to work with Ethereum Pro as well before. Uh, you can look at this. Uh, like I said, no architecture is wrong or right. And with this uh, topologies, justify, organization can have different needs. So if you see a lot of topologies where hy hybrid federated mesh starting from to fully federated mesh. So it's really dependent on organization what fits best for you actually. And there's another second blog where you can read about uh, AB number of architectures. So this is the first time I'm giving maybe as a, with a voiceover, but this architecture is already a level somewhere as a blog. So if you want to read, uh, you can read in full detail actually. Uh, I have been reading the book of uh, Chama Pelani, but recently I come up, uh, I also read the book of Data Mesh Practice actually. This is a book by a, Max and Arif, uh, actually, this is a nice book. Uh, first book talk about more on a theoretical concept. Uh, second book is more about what, how can you apply those in more into an organization? It's more practical. So I very strongly recommend you to uh, yeah, go through this book as well, if you have a time. And that's it uh, from my side. Uh, if you want to connect, uh, you can connect with it me on the LinkedIn, I'm available there. And yeah, so that has been a story from uh, AV Nambro. Uh, yeah, we have been always looking to, to improve. And if you have any questions uh, related to this topic or any other topic related to data, just give me a message or ping me. I would love to connect with you.
if you are a data engineer, actually, and if you think, uh, if you think this data architecture is nice and you can bring some value, just look at the career page of Avian Umbro. We have been very much hiring for a good data engineer. And just if you find any opportunities there on the career page, just message me or apply. We are very eager to, uh, we are always looking for good engineers. Thank you. Over to you, Scott. Yeah, and, and so uh, we've got some questions in the Q&A already. Um, so if anybody has other questions, uh, please do throw them in the Q&A so we can kind of uh, track those. Um, hopefully people don't mind, but I was going to jump uh, the queue a little bit here uh, on the Q&A. And, and I wanted to ask kind of a question. You have been doing this for four years, right? Yeah. So you started this journey and you were one of the few that was really somewhat public and really focused on doing decentralized data. So do you have like, what are the three most significant points that you would tell people of like what you ran into that you would tell them to avoid, right? Like, is that don't distribute absolutely everything, uh, you know, very, very fuzzy domain boundaries and things like that are, are a challenge or, or whatever. Um, is there anything that you would really talk to people about and say, please don't make this mistake that we did. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to adjust my screen. Just... Let me see. Uh, you can still see my screen? Or share, yes, or is... we can see the slides, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think we have been doing for four years, actually. And I think each year has been a learning year. So, uh, so from any organization, not to do is, first of all, I would say, don't drive this kind of initiative based on uh, uh, IT actually. So business has to be fully involved because you need to understand your consumer needs, your provider needs before making a data platform actually. So that will be one take actually. Uh, and that's where domain-driven design comes in the picture, actually. And we have been doing uh, quite a lot. Um, second, uh, I would say, is uh, more on the governance side as well. So I think governance is something you should look first before even uh, uh, making your data platform. Because you, you uh, without governance, data platform is nothing but an ETL tooling, actually. Uh, so that you need to, you need to be there much uh, put emphasis on that. Third is also you need to work on a vision actually. I, I said in the beginning, data platform always needs, takes time actually. So you need to put a vision and, and develop based on that. Should not be doing ad hoc actually things. So, and, and based on the vision, you can add certain capabilities actually. So that, that, that would be my uh, takeaway. Anyone want to build a data platform. Awesome. And then, um, so do you have the Q and A up in front of you? I know you were yeah. trying to get that. So, uh, did you want to pick a, a question from that as well? Of... Yeah, I will. I will look at questions. Okay. Somebody asked me. Okay. Uh, I think Anshuman asked me about uh, synthetic transformation engine. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, Within uh, so what we have noticed over the period of time is that uh, same, same, uh, more than one consumer uh, need basically same kind of uh, data sets integrated view. So for instance, you have data set A, data set B and data set C actually. And we see that more than one consumer want to combine those data set in their platform. So we say A, B, and C should be combined together to make a big data set. And what we, what we notice is this demand is maybe for some data sets very generic actually. So we say, okay, while before sharing the data, you can also do a, some kind of a joint synthetic transformations. So it does not change the, any value of data. So it's, it's uh, semantic, remains same. That's why it's called synthetic transformation engine. So in those cases, if three consumers need the same information, then they don't have to do it three times at their side. It's more effective to do it one side before sharing it itself. 
So that's what we, about uh, synthetic options. Um, then I think any pain points I already said uh, about this. Uh, I think Scott asked already questions. So, um, what I mean, I, Esther had asked uh, about the um, data creators, and I actually had a question about that as well, which was, yeah. you know, you, you were talking about that there's kind of the sourcing domain, and then it kind of goes through the transformation layer, and then there's a consuming domain. Are those considered actual data products, and who manages those, right? Like, and, and kind of tying into Esther's question of like, what do you actually consider as a producer? Is it that it is a system or is it that it has to be a domain that has very, very specific uh, ways that they formulate their data products? Yeah, so uh, there are two things. Huh? Uh, one's from responsibility, another from accountability. Actually. So if a certain domain is there, uh, if data is resides into an application, a domain providing, uh, you have application owner is more responsible to ensure data is shared, but who is accountable for that is a data owner actually. So data owner has to say, this data is made for this purpose and can be shared only with this particular question of that. So we, we, we go back to uh, uh, principle of uh, Russell matrix, you know, responsible, accountable, informed, and consultant. So we really follow that matrix actually. Yeah, I, th I think that's that makes a, a ton of sense. Um, and we we talked a little bit about this, you and I, uh, privately. But um, what would you, if someone were to talk about, you know, it's it's tough because it's four years in the past. But if someone were to think about that minimum viable platform, you talked about you have to match the consumer and the producer needs. You know, there's a lot of people that are saying they have to build out this huge, huge platform before getting going. Like, what would you think is that minimum viable aspect of that platform? Is it, you know, find just build to one or two data products and try to make sure that it's reusable or like, what advice would you give there? Yeah, so I think uh, I mentioned, if you start with data product uh, you, you uh, or data platform, you should first look for governance actually. So I think governance is minimum. You want to set it up. How producer, consumer want to exchange data in that part. After governance, I think most important will be uh, data as a product concept, which you really look into it actually. I, I feel uh, it's not about a file or API based JSON file or, or streaming, the Kafka. It's, it's more about uh, what is data mean for and what it means for the consumer. Because then if that is there, then only you can bring some business value and make autonomous decision out of the data actually. Because you make the platform to generate some business value actually. And I think these three are more important. And, and once you have this, then you have a lot of opportunity actually to extend with more capability on your uh, data. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, there's a couple in here that talk a little bit about the same thing, but like, how did you move forward with this? How did you convince people to start to move towards that cross-functional team, right? A lot of people are in these very big silos and they're trying to move uh, out of that. Like what, again, do you have any advice or do you have anything that, that made it so that it was easy to actually start to convince people that you could go down this path? Yeah, I think, uh, more than more than convincing people, it's also based on organization. Huh? Uh, it's, it's, I think I said data makes the organizational change. And it means you also need to see what best fit for you actually. And, and in, in terms of convincing, I think, I think we should go in a traditional way actually. So you, you need to do a POC and see how fast you can share the data, keeping the governance and, and, and that's very, uh, IT model actually, and, and definitely you can also, if you, if you want to convince your organization to do a data mesh, first you look at what data mesh is actually, and then assess what data mesh bring to value to organizations, 
and maybe wise to uh, refer to some implementation done by some companies and probably talk to them and see before starting actually. You really need to understand what it means and what value it brings to your organization before starting up. You should not be doing data mesh because everyone is doing data mesh. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people expect me to push back on that, but I fully agree. Like, if you if you don't need to descent, I, I come from distributed systems background. If you don't need to dis distribute your systems, don't distribute your systems. If you don't need to decentralize your data, don't decentralize your data. If the centralization isn't the bottleneck, yeah, yeah. you're you're you're, um, you're you're singing my song. Like that's <laughs> yeah, but it's, sometimes it's also important that in in in, in organization which is not mature which is not uh, a lack of awareness. Maybe you, maybe centralization is a way to start with. We start with centralizations, bring some awareness about, teach people how to do a governance, teach people how to share the data. And then a certain moment, if you're mature enough, then you start with decentralization because you want to cope up with the demand of organizations. Yeah. Uh, so, Juanis Rosier is at DP, when he was yeah. at DPG Media, I had that same story of he came in and it was just kind of dispersed it wasn't really decentralized it was just all over the place and so he centralized it so people could understand what were good practices right i, I think that's that there is a maturity model that just because you want the benefits of data mesh doesn't mean that it's the right it's right for you right now and maybe it's right for you ever right like there there's a lot of organizations where it might not ever be right for them so yeah. I wanted to uh, throw back to the Q&A. I don't want to <laughs> take up all of the time here, but like, I think uh, Ajith's question is, is a really good one of, you've been doing this for four years, but the evolution is not done. You're still experimenting. You're still learning. You're still kind of changing things. So what what's kind of next on your list for optimizing or changing, improving? Where, where do you think that you're still, you have some some room to improve? I think in the world of digitalization, you always have a new technology, a new business model, which, which will be driving your organization. And, and, and to drive your organization, you need a support of data platform, automated decisions. So I think it's, it, it's never will be done actually. So you always will be evolving and, and making it, which fits your uh, uh, platform in a, uh, which fits your business model actually. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, like I said, uh, if you look at domain-driven design, at so the consuming side, we are quite far ahead where we, we do a lot of domain design, but in the sourcing side, I mentioned, we, we're still not there yet, and we, we are continuously busy, busy with making a self-service capabilities, and we are enable provider to, to, to source the data even with a faster pace, actually. So, but that's what we're looking at, and more and more self-service features, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's uh, very good insight, especially that you've been doing this for four years and you're still not at at a place where it's super easy to bring on new data, right? Like it's still like data mesh doesn't solve a lot of the 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 issues. It's not like it's the solution. It's a framework for addressing the challenges, and you're still going to have challenges as you move forward. I think that that's important too. <laughs> remember and it's great that somebody who's as advanced as you are is, is, is also saying that um so uh there was another question of if possible please touch base on the business areas of transformation targeted and achievements utilizing the data mesh concept so like do you have any stories of what's been your return on your investment is there anything where you can say like we were really trying to change this one area, you know, lending or something like that? Was there anything where you were really targeting towards? No, but um, we, uh, we do a lot of automated, uh, automated decision actually based on data platform. Uh, we use a lot of ML, AI models, and uh, also a lot of BI reporting to give an insight to management so they can take uh, informed choices. And also in, in terms of marketing, we use our platform a lot. So I think there are a few uh, things which we are already doing actually. And further than that, it will be difficult to explain you uh, on that part. <laughs> without without getting super deep in, into the way yeah. banks work so, and stuff. But is, is there anything where 
like, how do you measure your, your return? Is it time to market of new data? Is it the amount, you know, number of data driven decisions? Is there anything that, that you've seen that you kind of say, this is how we measure if we're being successful? Yeah, so um, I think this split, we do it quite, as a bank, we do it quite, quite a bit of regulatory reporting. Huh? It's obligatory for us as well. And we use the data platform actually to, to make it up. So any, any help to that is all, of course, return on investment. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's there. So for me, actually, it's, it's difficult to measure, but people who, who are working out on this definitely are able to measure actually what value it brings in. And trust me, it's, it's bringing a lot of value to our uh, bank actually. Yeah, it's it, that measuring that impact. I, I, yeah, it's very difficult. It, it, we've got, you know, we're so focused on having, you know, correct information in our data, and yet we don't have good data about <laughs> what is the impact yeah. of our data work. It's kind of funny. Um, so uh, Michael had asked um, a, a couple of questions, but like, how much of your data platform was build versus buy versus integration of components? Yeah, so we, we try to use the native services of cloud as much as you could do, actually. And if that doesn't fit in, then, then, then we try to uh, see how can we tweak it to make it uh, work for us. Yeah. So that's, that's what we do. We okay. try to, because one of the advantages we are on the cloud native, and one of the advantages we want, we want to make use of, actually, uh, cloud native capability as well. Yeah. Um, so the next one was about the data marketplace and like how do consumers actually discover, identify, and then request access for the data? Is that self-service process that you know brings the consumer together, or is it through uh, something so consumer, more manual? Uh, so consumer more or less know uh, what data they need on which domain. So they can they can go to a marketplace, they can search what data is available within the catalog. And they can also look at the metadata and from which domain it's coming, uh, what is the accuracy, what is the data quality of that data, who is the person to contact, and if they like it and maybe they, they need it probably, if they found the right data, from there onwards they can start a, a journey to consume it. And then the workflow will start. Specifically to... And then just... everyone will be informed about that. So it's, okay. it's a fully self-service. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And, and specifically to discovery, is there anything where you could give people some tips? Because I think this is a thing of, of um, matching those consumers' possible demands or possible interest levels and what's available has been very difficult for a lot of folks. Is it, so is there anything that you found where people can really discover a lot more easily? Yeah, so we do a lot of uh, uh, tagging and we also collect metadata which helps you to discover as well. But we also have uh, another thing as well. Like we, we also have another cataloging and we also have a metadata related uh, implementation which also helps actually throughout, uh, throughout our journey, which is I'm not focusing for today actually. Uh, but yeah, so there are like we, we asked enough information from provider also to make it more discoverable for the consumer actually in Excel. Okay. So I, I explained about a sourcing guideline actually, and those guidelines are actually uh, demanding certain information from provider actually to make it more consumable. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, another question here was, how does the consumer share their requirements with the provider? Are the consumers required to go to each provider separately with their requirements? I mean, I think, especially when you think about, you talked about, oh yeah, you might have information from these 10 upstream different data sets. Do they have to just say, I want to access your data set or do they have to share what their use case is downstream? And, and I, this might be somewhat uh, for banks where it's, it's a little bit, um, you know, there's high regulatory, but especially in healthcare, life sciences, things like that. If you can back into who might be the patient by combining a lot of data, that makes it PII. And so <laughs> it, it's something that in and of itself isn't PII. It can become PII by combining it with other stuff that's not PII. Um, so we'd love to, to, to kind of hear how you, how you go with that and like how are consumers actually saying, 
I want to do this? Like, what's the actual process? Uh, it's both. It's a combination of both. So in certain cases, you might need one or two data sets. You just, um, you just request it and it's a one-time process actually. So you also get, uh, okay, I want to share your data and then regularly once you have an agreement done, then you, you get data continuously, updated data as well. But you can also say, okay, there's a use case and this use case requires this many data sets because this is for some purpose and you can request, so you can also get a kind of a blanket approval based on the use case. That's okay. also, that's more about a, a user, end user uh, experience actually. It's more about, you don't want to do it 20 times. You probably want to do one times and include 20 data sets together. Yeah, as much ease of access and automation and all that is, is just- Yeah, so we, we are continuously improving that on, on as well because uh, everyday provider and consumer using our portal, they, they, they provide a the feedback and in each increment we are adding a new and new feature to tell them. So this is a, a question that I've kind of run across a lot in the conversations of kind of embedded, but like, what is the platform team makeup, right? Is it data engineers? Some, some people have said that you shouldn't just have data engineers or really data heavy folks because they don't know as well the business or the, the ways of working of the software engineers. And if you're asking the software engineers to deliver the data, you kind of have to understand how software engineers work. So what, what is the, the, plat, the makeup of the platform team? Yeah, so the platform team is basically works on capabilities rather than the data. So, so for instance, you can think of a different ingestion pattern. So whether it's a batch API or, or uh, streaming or maybe a metadata registration API. So if you want to, first you want to register a metadata by API before you even want to uh, send your data because we also need to, uh, we talk about a data as a product and data as a product make more sense when you have metadata and data together. Uh, yeah, so those are some capabilities which platform team consciously evil, uh, basically make it on the platform and and then data team use, make use of those platform actually to, to perform certain activity. And, and it's true, data team knows about the data, not the platform team. They are they're just generating a generic capabilities which can be used by many data teams. Um, and, and we're coming up on time. So I think we've got okay. a couple of last questions. Is there, if, if there's any that you see in there that you really wanna go with, but I, I was thinking um, Senthil's question is kind of the follow-up on the data discovery of, like, are you just doing keyword search for the data products? Like that, that feels very rudimentary when we're talking about data discovery. It, it, you know, is this something that, that you're seeing or is there a ways to address that where people can really almost make yeah, so maybe recommendation it's, it's, engine of <laughs> data you might like? Yeah, so it's, it's more than that. So uh, you, you, you can... You can have a, a keyword search on the data set name. You can have it with a description. You, if you know the data owner, you can also find out how many data he owns, actually. You can also say, okay, uh, this data is used in this domain, uh, this industry uh, within internal uh, boundaries, actually. This business line, uh, which are the system which is providing this data. So a lot more, actually, than the, just a keyword search. So have a lot of parameters uh, and, and, and the people who basically look into the system and consume, they, they're quite educated people. Uh, like I mentioned, creating awareness is also important too. Uh, so they know how to search and what data they need. But we, we like you mentioned, Chantel, we also, um, uh, we also try to improve the user experience, see what new keyword we can add it to make life easier actually. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's just a, it's a difficult question of yeah, like yeah. of how do you how do you share knowledge with people that don't know that that knowledge might exist, right? Or or find that. Um, so uh, I think a good last question is like I kind of had this as well because you were talking about you've got your governance layer, your metadata layer, and your data layer. But like, how are you actually documenting that data? Um, you know, are you just using kind of a uh, catalog is that part of the it sounds like it's part of the marketplace but like are people putting it in the code so then and it gets pulled into the 
um, into the thing, into the uh, marketplace automatically, or like, how is that actually working as a, as a mechanism? So, like I said, uh, we're nothing putting in the code because uh, what we're doing is uh, to the data marketplace, you have a couple of supporting applications. We saw dial sourcing application and dial consuming applications. And that sourcing application is where we, we, we keep all the data related to provide in it. And then there are a way to register it. So we have an API, which you could call it, and then it will register your data set and make it available in data marketplace. Actually, then you can look at in uh, APIs. You can just search and make a use of, if you want to, if you want to consume, then you can just go on and do the rest of the process. Okay. Um, so we're, we're at time, but I, I've got okay. a little bit of time if you, if you want to do one last question or I, I think. Yeah, um, maybe let's, let's, let's see one or two, if there are one or two, then we can just take it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what did you do? What did you use specifically to develop your marketplace, uh, and your data governance so you said it was kind of cloud native tools, but like, is there anything that you had to roll your own or any, any, and I know sometimes you can't disclose what, what tools specifically, but anything that made this uh, process easier for you? No, uh, so I think tooling perspective, I said we are cloud native uh, on Microsoft, so that's not a uh, problem to disclose. Uh, uh, what we did was basically uh, in order to build that, we, we have a lot of inputs and input for knowledgeable people. Within our organization, we have data governance team. We have dedicated data governance team, which actually advise how data governance uh, should be look like. How and then we also have education team actually, which continuously uh, helping uh, uh, data owners and data to work throughout the bank to educate them about uh, data governance. So. This, this, this build up has come up with, uh, this build has come up with the result of a lot of ideas actually. And also uh, I have to give some credit to our management actually. Uh, the people in data domain, uh, which is heading to our department is also very quite uh, knowledgeable and they know how data works actually. Based on the history, so they also quite, uh, quite promote these kind of things. So uh, I'm the great answer. And, and the last question that we've got is in a domain driven architecture, is the domain responsible to extract data based on their requirements or the data platform team is responsible to get this data arranged for different domains based on their requirements? I think the, the goal is probably for the domains, but it, is that always yeah. the case or? <laughs> yeah, so the yeah, domain is responsible for pulling the data. Uh, but data uh, data team based on the data sharing agreement data platform also make sure that those data are available now. And I said we are also looking to shift more left. So we also want to see how can we make it more providers and consumers together uh, more closer. So we are also looking and automating those processes. Is there anything you do around SLAs on that? Because like I mean I know. This is a thing that keeps coming up of people over-engineering their data products where the, the consumers are like, it's fine if it's refreshed daily. And they're like, we're refreshing it every five minutes. And everyone's like, why? We don't need that. No, we have, we have SLA as well. So it's, it's a dictated by sometimes consumer. So consumers say we need the data every day. So then provider has to provide based on that. And it's all part of data setting agreement as well. So the SLA is there. It's kind of a negotiation. It's that collaborative negotiation of what do we actually need? What is the, cons yeah, yeah. so the, the producer isn't over architecting, yeah. but they are still serving consumer needs. Like that's, yeah. okay, that, that's awesome. Well, again, Rakesh, this has been so great. Thank you so much for um, taking the time. Thank you everybody, the attendees for everyone. great questions, Design. you know, all of that. So, and- Thanks uh, a lot for hosting. Yeah, and the slides will be available as well as the video will be available